in the can. <laughs> I'm John Savage. Although I'm a Londoner, I love this city. It's my second home. I lived here for several years in the late 70s. When I lived here, the music was doomy and the city was a mess. Now the music has changed and the city has changed. I want to find out why the music comes out of the city in the way that it does and how that music has changed the city. The idea is to drive around the city for 24 hours to find out what Manchester's like now. First stop is Hume, that mid-60s attempt at social engineering now being torn down and rebuilt. During the last 10 years, its dereliction has provided a home for musicians, students, artists. As our first guide, John Robb, explains. Probably the nicest walkway block around Hume was like the Yuppie block, you know. It's all been painted up. Because we have the Hume offices there, you know, like the council things. So we get spoiled, we've got, we've got no cockroaches, we get like painted up, we get our windows done up and things, you know. These are like the notorious crescents, these are like the uh, worst part to live in really. But well, the flats actually used to be really good inside. The funniest thing about them is that they said they were structurally unsound. They had to knock them down. They found out now they're knocking them down. They're really built really tough and they're really hard to knock down, you know. So what really happened solid. to the area? Why did it come so run down? Well, the council ran it down. When it, when it first time it was open, like, mostly work class families managed to want to live here because they had central heating, really good flats, you know. Yeah. But the council's run it down over the years. And I, I don't, think, don't think they really thought about it that much, did they, you know, when they built these sort of places. I mean, these are meant to be built on the shades of the crescents of Bath, you know, yeah. that's why they're crescent shapes. See, it's really quiet around here now, it's hardly all little around here at all. Do you think you need empty urban spaces near the city centre to well, have I think yeah. you should have a cheap inner city accommodation, you yeah. know. Because I, mean, I think, like, uh, stuff like, like rock and roll, or anything, music, techno, rock music, or anything is an inner city culture, and it's not about living in villages out in Cheshire, yeah. is it, you know? Like, I mean, people aren't asking for very much, are they, you know, to live in places like this, and, uh, Put a lot back in this community as well. I mean, a lot of people do, don't they? You know. I mean, an art scene always needs a, a bohemian type of area to thrive, doesn't it? I mean, you've got like Kreuzberg and Berlin. That's dying as well now, isn't it? I mean, I've heard Amsterdam's becoming the main bohemian place in Europe now. But everyone, everyone's moving up there. <laughs> It's now three o'clock, one of the first blocks in Hume to be refurbished is Hopton Court, right on the east side near the student quarter. We're going there to meet Anif Cousins and Colin Thorpe of Chapter and Verse, long-term Hume Moss Side residents who write, play and sing eloquently about their part of the city. It was a place where a lot of people, you know, could get together and, you know, and uh, play. Also, you didn't have that hassle of next door neighbours because I think everybody was like a lot more easy going around Hume, you know, they could tolerate the noise. I can remember when I was like part of my exams, rock bands would set up in the um, in the crescents and play like it was an amphitheatre. It was ridiculous, you know. You know, it was like Guns and Roses concert, you know, indie band. So, but you know, you just that was part of Hume. That was a makeup of Hume. How did the area become to be a problem in the first place? Was the design of the buildings wrong? Was the whole planning of the area wrong? What happened? I don't know. It's part of, part of this. 50s, 60s utopian idea, wasn't it? That uh, you construct these cities in the sky, etc., etc., and the walkways and everything would be wonderful. Yeah. The British people have never lived vertically, as, as opposed to their <laughs> continentals, who, uh, who don't seem to have any problem with walking up four or five you know, flights of stairs to flats. Um, doesn't seem to be a problem. I'd, I'd like to buy my flat, but I know it would be unfair to take council housing stock. <laughs> You know what I mean? But it, it, I must admit, this bit, you know, I'm really fortunate to get this block. Like some of the other blocks, like Meredith, have been done up as well. And they're coming along and, like, they've knocked down a lot of the blocks down over there. And it, it looks better already to me. I mean, I like, I spoke to people and they said they're, they're glad they're all going down, you know. And, uh, like, you know, go around my side and you see some of the new houses with, you know, fences where you don't see your next door neighbour. People seem to enjoy that, you know. As you listen to this, Try to identify with the philosophy. Ghetto is a state of mind. It's not where you live your life, but how your life is lived. Look, a goth. 
I haven't seen a goth for ages. A mile and a half southwest of Hume lies the debtors' retreat, Chalton. It's now home to many Manchester musicians, members of the Stone Roses, Ten People, A Certain Ratio, and 808 States' Graham Massey. I think it's like the nearest sort of tree-lined place to town, really. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be too far out of the action, which is, you know, about a mile that way. You know. Yeah, you can imagine you're not in Manchester at the same time. You know, it's quite villagey, <laughs> self-contained. So we're hearing a new world now, aren't we? I hear a new world. I hear a new world. You, you've been a musician in Manchester for how long? About 10, 15 years? Is that all 10 years? Yeah, about yeah. 10 years. How has it changed over the last 10 years? Um, well, it's become a lot more successful, I think, when in my, in my day, if you weren't, uh, in my day, it's like, you, either, you got the punk lump, yeah. and then you got the, the house lump later on, and in between is this huge desert where nobody did nothing. I think music's just become a lot more accessible, uh, you know, making it for you know, like people, you know, they can get a record out easier. They black studio time, they borrow instruments. <laughs> They don't pay for anything. And then the, the first point where you spend money is having it pressed up, having it mastered, which costs you about maybe £800 or something. And then you sell them through record shops, you know, record shops like Eve and Bob. You need, uh, you know, roots for your music, you know, and I think it just sort of drifted around for a while trying to find an identity. And we, we found it with, like, computer music. As we started, you know, listening to dance music a lot more, I think the computer thing really freed you up and allowed you to make music that you wanted to make. So and, mu and music yeah. that you could actually sort of, that had a use. Is it just a coincidence or is there any significance in the fact that the computer was invented in Manchester? Yeah, somebody told me that the other day. I was quite shocked. I think, yeah, the computer was invented in Manchester, but I think we also invented the Luddite as well in Manchester. <laughs> so if the computer was invented, it was probably like putting a cupboard for a few years while somebody else developed it. Cars are sort of the most important place for our music, I think. You know. that's, that's the place where we know, it, you know, if it works in the car, it'll work everywhere. We make great travelling music. Manchester's absolutely packed full of great driving moments. This is one of them. It's got everything. GMX, Refuge Building, Town Hall, Eastgate, Knot Mill, Boardwalk. Going over the River Medlock now. That's Pete Waterman's new building, the church. And the painted up bridges. City based on transport. Canals, rivers, roads, metros, trains, every conceivable form of transport you could want. Here we are, the library, the town hall, people on their way to Prince. Yep, waiting for the crown. Here we are. Well, they haven't run anybody over yet, but I'm sure they will soon. Altrincham to Bury, direct. On a night like this, it looks like the perfect plan of a city. This is how planners would like to see the city. Everybody's getting on the trams, it's sunny, there's enough people around. It's wonderful. Typical of the new Manchester confidence is Manto's, the mixed bar right in the heart of what's now called Manchester's Gay Village. It's the perfect pre-club mid-evening stop-off with views of the newly cleaned Rochdale Canal and the Whitworth Street Corridor, Central Manchester Development Corporation's regeneration zone right across the south of the city centre. Held together by the canal, the zone takes in Piccadilly Village in the east, new accommodation like India and Lancaster Houses in the centre, and clubs like the Hacienda and the Boardwalk to the west. It's about nine, the time for a drive. We're going to go now to one of my favourite streets in Manchester. Best street in Manchester, this. So 
here's the uh, remnants of the Industrial Revolution. All around us. Wonderful set for a film, which hasn't been made. But not a very nice place to live. East Manchester was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. I suppose in its day it was as bad as we think of Eastern Europe now. Smog, emissions, pollution. And now there's almost nothing here. So what's in the place? Of? The past into the present. The Industrial Revolution is a techno city. It's 11 o'clock, Friday night. One of the two club nights of the week. Even in the recession. Next stop is the boardwalk, just south of Whitworth Street in Knott Mill. Tonight is Dave Haslam's classic disco night, Yellow, and I talked to owner Colin Sinclair at 11 o'clock, just before the club hot start. It's an old Sunday school. It was built in 1876, before any of this urban desolation you see around you was ever here. When it was built, it was surrounded by fields, plain fields. When I found it, which was some seven years ago, it was completely derelict. As, was, as really was much of the inner city. I think the boom of Manchester music owes a lot to like, the urban landscape itself and the fact that in this area there were so many derelict warehouses and derelict mills and nobody could use them for anything at all. And along would come a band that needs somewhere to practice. And unlike many other cities, Manchester had all these huge, like, empty urban cathedrals waiting for people to do something in. Um, there was a whole... I'd say five years ago there were a lot of rehearsal studios. Just on that strip of land there was where TJ Davison's was, where Joy Division used to rehearse. Um, it was all there. There's a very obvious link between Manchester music and the structure of Manchester as a city. You just need to look at the early factory period bands like Joy Division and you can see that they were directly influenced by the urban landscape, as was the music the whole image, the way of dress, the lyrical content, the graphic design, that was all based on a city which was undergoing like a painful transition from being like the hotbed of the industrial revolution, factories, mills, everywhere was grimy, concrete all around. When it rained, it was all concrete. The rain stayed around, everybody wore the max. It really was you know, the industrial city. And that spawned a whole musical genre which, which was quite you know, original throughout the country. And then later on, by the Smiths, you can take so many lyrical references on the landscape from the lyrics of the Smiths. And I think that what happened originally was the landscape influenced the bands. And now we're seeing a change where the bands are influencing the landscape. One of the prime sites on Whitworth Street is the Hacienda, celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Ligon de Ritveld is curator of the exhibition about the club's history. It's a change in the way that, that a lot of the derelict spaces around here were, were done up and reused and in, 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 in new use. It's like the derelict train stations, the GMX now, and uh, the old gas factory, you know, the, the, the British Council's down there now, and there's some nice shops around here. The, night, the nightclubs are important because they're like a, a point of socialising and also uh, a space where to forget daily reality. And it's also a space where you sort of recharge your emotional energies, very much like a church in a way, a nighttime church. From six o'clock to possibly ten o'clock on a sun on a Saturday night, there was um, thousands upon thousands of youngsters, 16, 17, younger, 15, 14, who from the outside areas, from Bradford, from Leeds. Mainly Yorkshire. Coming I mean, down to most of the clubs. This was Round Tree, now the X Club. Right. That was Round Tree there. Yeah. How many? Do you, do you have any idea of how many um, how many clubs there are in Manchester at the moment? At the moment, I think there's 100, 130 in the surrounding areas. At that at that particular time in the in, in the 60s, there was, I believe, around about 250, 300. That's taking the outskirts in again. We're just passing now the, the Andale Centre where 